forget and bounce YouTube. Uh, and before we start quickly, I got a poll here. If you would, I've got two questions to ask you. One is just simply where you think you are right now. I guess this is a pretty dumb question because we asked the same thing on Wednesday. There's a different group here though. <clears throat> I think a lot more people yeah. are intermediate and advanced. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's, so I can share the results just to quickly, but probably more importantly, uh, let me see. This one right here says, just give Matt a sense, were you here Wednesday night or were you not? So we've got one newcomer so far. Yeah, we know who that one is. And we're darn glad she's here. All right. Okay. Oh, good. Wow, you got a 93% return rating. I wish I had that in my classroom. Oh, wait a minute. There you go. Sorry. I wish I had that in my classroom, man. All right. Take it. Let me just double check the recordings, make sure we're good. Uh, recording up there. YouTube recording is starting. Starting. Just one more second. And while you're doing that, you guys can see my screen here that I'm going to present off of, right? Quantum workshop series. Everything looks good there. Yes, we can. All right. All right. Off your uh, video, Matt, and I'll get out of your way. All right. I am going to stop my video so you don't have to look at me looking over the side. And uh, thank you all for coming back to uh, this meetup. This is the second of five. Um, we'll do this tonight and then we'll do three next week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And um, <clears throat> for, as a sort of a recap and, and it's an introduction to our, our newer members, um, I want to kind of go through, <clears throat> set the stage, set the context of what this is for. Um, and I'll, I'll struggle to, to, to keep the more advanced uh, of you uh, interested and occupied. But this, this tack that I'm taking, this is a quantum workshop series. It was originally designed as an internal uh, vehicle to help educate uh, future quantum engineers in Opt for a big company. Um, and we think that uh, that quantum's got a space in the healthcare area. Uh, so we're, we're sort of doing this to, to build capacity. Uh, and so this was a hands-on, it's designed as a hands-on workshop. I mean, we're, we've got an event that's going to happen a few months from now where Optum teaches Optum. It's called the Developer Days, and we'll have a number of people who are actually going to have their hands on the keyboard um, going through this. And it was meant to be an educational vehicle that educates through experience. You know, you touch something, you make something work, you see it happen in action, you can actually tinker with it, you can play with it next number of ways and develop a conceptual intuition. And that's the key thing. And we're going to get into why uh, conceptual intuition is very important as a reminder for everyone here and as, as, as something uh, new to our newcomers. But that's the genesis of this. We wanted to have a hands-on experiential learning vehicle that, that could be cobbled together with anything we could uh, that would focus mainly on the concepts and not the implementation frameworks or simulators or anything like that. And we'll tell you why in a little bit, but that's really who it was for. So. Uh, this workshop's for anybody who wants solid experience as an introduction to quantum and the series, this entire series. Um, it's not for the experienced PhD or folks who are good in this space already, um, although you might have, you find, might find it interesting uh, as a teaching vehicle. Um, the goal is to develop strong intuition primarily as that's our, that's what we're seeing in front and center. The frameworks and implementation simulators, things like all secondary to that. Um, but it is an experienced based uh, mechanism at first and, uh, and foremost. So last week we went through a, a preparation primer. We'll do a quick drive-by for that just to, as a recap or last, last two days ago. It's not last week. Um, and then we took a deep dive into blocks, the qubit and the block sphere. And we'll kind of show you what we covered back then. Today we're going to do quantum gates to quantum circuits. And all of these things are meant to, um, to build off of each other as the methodical pedagogy that incrementally grows over time. Um, and the next one we'll, we'll tackle after this is called quantum key, uh, computing key concepts, all the things like 
teleportation, entanglement, superpositioning, thing, and things like that. But we'll take a deeper dive and 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 work through experiments uh, in those spaces. Then we'll get into simple quantum algorithms. Um, as I'll take a pretty good dive in that, uh, and that's where we will really start seeing some movement um, in that space uh, to develop those things. We'll get into quantum problems and practical. So this will get into sort of how the this, the, how do you start thinking about algorithms? Well, we're going to look at some of the building blocks of that today um, in, in quantum gates, quantum circuits. And then we follow that up with quantum practicals. You know, how do you actually do something interesting? You know, um, and then we kind of tap it off with a little bit of QML, at the quantum machine learning. Uh, we don't take a deeper dive because I wanted to say sort of generic and not get into other frameworks. So that's the series that we have. Um, what we do... In the preparation and primer, we're going to do a drive-by real fast here, is <clears throat> we cover um, really the context, and we're going to go over that again just for sake of, of, of purpose here and, and, and do a dr quick drive-by there. But then we sort of walk through all the simulators and frameworks we use to isolate the concepts from different perspectives instead of just looking at a framework of it. And that really has we've seen value in it. it it did the job and there's some, some references and things like that so my tenant here the reason that i developed this is because it didn't exist so if you look at the the framework here um you really have three segments out there you've got the producers of quantum tech people making the technology they're skilled in mathematics and, and quantum physics and chemistry and 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 the physics of the substrate they're using to hold subatomic particles long enough to do information processing on them. Their education regimen is completely different. Um, the consultants are hybrid. We're not going to talk about them right now, but we are the consumers. This is on the very other end. So this group is wonderful. God love them. They're powerful intellectual uh, giants, but they're small. And the money and the bigger groups on the consumer side, you know, you get a Fortune 500 company with 300,000 employees that want to use this to do something sometime in the future. How do you get competencies in there. The educational requirements for those folks fall into two distinct camps. One, software engineering. We don't need to know opaque mathematics and dense quantum physics, but we do need to know software engineering. And if we have that, and we don't have to have the burden of, the, of what's required in this space uh, on math and quantum physics, we can actually do something interesting. And they also need professional consultancy skills because we're going to be talking to the C-suite. We're going to be talking to upper level management. We're going to talk to investors, you know, things like that. So the folks who take the tech that the producers create and do something with them are the consumers. And the educational pedagogy is completely different. And, and the archetype of the people we're interested in is fundamentally different as well. Now, these consultants in the middle is a really interesting breed. Um, and they can go either way. So we're really not going to be worried about that. But I wanted to just lay this out because everything we do is going to go against this backdrop. It's going to be laid against this backdrop. And of course, now here's our roadmap. We need to, um, uh, and it's also a roadmap of this series. So what we had, you know, we have this sort of goal here and we sort of re-engineered it or backward engineered it. And we said, what do we do if we got somebody who's got zero experience? How do we get them uh, up to where we are? That's where this workshop is sort of that introduction, experiential introduction. So that's where we are. Um, and the rest of these things are just things that will pop in today's simple computer architecture, uh, you know, experiential frameworks that we're looking at. We do some videos. Uh, we've got some stuff from FET Interactive on waves, interface, interactions, or interference. We do a lot with circle initiation. Uh, anybody in the field knows this. The beginners don't, though. So, um, you know, hex, uh, uh, binary counting and how it fits within the circuits are things we'll touch on. Um, blocks for a playground is a really good thing to build intuition. Um, and so on and so forth. There's a number of different vehicles that we'll use. Quirk is all, always a great one. Uh, we'll use that. Um, and of course, the O'Reilly's book uh, for software engineers is really quite good. And we'll leverage that uh, quite, quite a lot as well. And of course, we're going to use QIS kit. So that's a quick drive-by of the uh, quantum computing preparation primer. What we did in the qubits in the hey, Matt, deep... Yeah. Can you uh, try, can you just maximize your browser window at least? So we can get any more. Uh, let me see if we can anything? do this. How about that? A little I better? I didn't see anything change. I Almost. moved up the, um, let's see if I can do this. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's at least a little better. 
or we could do this and I could do this. Let's see if I can work with this. So I'm moving cool. up the font. So the fonts are getting bigger. Yeah. Okay. It's not going to mess you up on your side and then, yeah. and then maximize your browser. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Okay. Uh, it's a little better, I think. All right. Okay. We'll see how it goes. I may have yeah, to yeah. shrink it a little bit. Depends. All right. But, um, so the qubit block sphere, the deep dive we took uh, really centered on foundations. So we, took a deep dive here in terms of the foundational principles. I won't go into them right now, but there's some exercises we did in that as well. Uh, and then we basically went into using a lot of these hands-on vehicles to talk about phases and block spheres, magnitude in the block sphere. Uh, and then we got into single qubit gates and all their rotations. Uh, and, and in this, we took we, uh, we uncovered a lot of nuances from various perspectives that allowed us to really hone in on the concepts there. What does phases and magnitudes and amplitudes do for us when we begin to build algorithms and they loom large in that space. And then there's this area for single qubit gates and rotations. And we did a drive by there, but we sort of stopped uh, when it came to the root of not gate uh, because one of the things we found there was that we could, um, we could begin using basic parameters, basic uh, gate rotations and things like that to build and construct gates we didn't have in our repertoire. And that's really kind of an important thing to do. That was uh, where we left off. And we took a look at that from a number of different angles. We won't go into those today. Um, but that gave us a chance to get to where we are today, quantum gates to quantum circuits. When you look at, hey, can we use some of these, if we've got X number of, of gates available to us, how can we begin to put some of those together to create something more, uh, more elaborate? Um, and more, uh, more powerful. So that brings us here. And what I would like to do here, and I'm just gonna give you the, the, the once over at a high level, um, we'll take a look at digital logic. Uh, I, it, it dawned on me and as, as I was putting this together that many folks may not have had a uh, background in, in architecture um, and digital logic. And that looms large in terms of how these, um, the stovepipe, uh, processes uh, in quantum computing and the creation of algorithms because it's very much like that assembler-based programming. So making a quick developmental detour down here and tinkering out with you know, basic gates and things like that is, is, is a worthwhile, uh, profitable enterprise. So we're going to go do that. And then we're going to cascade into saying, well, then as we looked at the single gate rotations last, last uh, uh, presentation, we'll get into multiple gates uh, and, and particularly knots and C-knots uh, and CC-knots, swaps and C-swaps. Uh, they become building blocks towards more elaborate um, kinds of processes. And, and you'll see that it is a very direct doppelganger to how the, the digital logic gates be, can be combined together to do more sophisticated things. And, it, and it's a very natural progression. So they, that's why I sort of wanted to uh, to sort of put it that way. Um, and then we'll get into something where we're really making that big shift, mapping digital logic to quantum logic operations. That's a big jump. And that allows us to really see how these things can be put together directly. Um, and that is another methodical step in the way. And then we sort of end up just building a, a basic incrementer and decrementer um, and looking at it from a number of different frameworks to, to see how all this kind of stuff fits together. Um, so that's the plan for tonight. So let's get into it. Uh, remember, this stuff is meant to be a hands-on uh, experience for, for a group of people. So that's kind of how I designed it. So uh, for those of you who have never seen digital logic before, this is a not gate. Um, and probably the easiest way to look at it is just to pop over here uh, in circuit first and play with this stuff. So a not gate basically takes an input and then swaps it out. So you can click on this to make it uh, to make it one and not gate makes it zero. If I wanted to switch that back and not gate will make it one. Uh, the same thing as the reverse. It's just the way that thing works. Um, and an AND gate, you know, so a not gate is the reverse. Uh, an AND gate is both. So we can click on one of those. This is standard stuff uh, for folks who have been in the computer science background, but for those who aren't, then it may not be that way. So this is a digital, lo digital logic circuit. Uh, both of these things have to be ones, which is considered on before the, the light bulb goes off. And if one of these is not, then that's not gonna be the case. Um, so you're starting to see the truth tables associated with this, which is a foundation of logic. Um, so the 
Um, the next is the NAND gate, which you might think of as not both. So if the uh, best way to look at that is to say, well, here's a NAND gate. And if we, here's a bunch of different in institutions, uh, in instances of that, um, zero and zero, turn it on. So it's not both. Uh, but when you have one and one, I think it's over here, it's gonna be very hard to see. It turns off right now. So um, that's, that's kind of good to see that. Although that was, if you could see that from where you are, your eyes are really good. Uh, so the NAND gate, uh, OR gate is another one of those things, the truth tables over here. I don't wanna burden you with all of that, but this is more to just give you a flavor of the different types of gates that are out there on the digital logic side. There's a NOR gate, there's an XOR gate. So a NOR gate is not one or the other. Uh, the XOR gate is only one or the other. So a lot of these just nuanced variations in that, but those nuanced variations, and you'll see this when it comes to the space of doing problems and practicals uh, matter because we'll look at things in a digital logic sense, recalibrate those in terms of a quantum logic sense and then solve the problem. And it makes a big difference. And that's why I put this in here. But if we were to look at some more complicated things, you could take a half and a half adder. So this is a half hour. If you've taken an out architecture course, uh, you know what a half hour adder is. Uh, it, it, it has the sum and carry over kinds of things. And as you change your inputs here, uh, those change. The logic is taking effect here and we can actually tinker with it and play. Uh, full adder is, is quite a bit different, um, but it's still just a function of logic that's been well thought through. Uh, and then we can put those gates to it at a physical level and get those capabilities there. Uh, a full subtractor is very much the same thing. And if we really wanted to go whole hog, here's an entire computer system set up here or, or a simple computer really. And, um, and it works. I mean, you can start tinkering on things and touching things and gates pop up and, and data moves left and right. And you've got memory here and all kinds of neat stuff. Um, but this shows that you can develop sophisticated um, uh, tools with simple gates. And that's the thought that I wanted to articulate to folks who are coming in here. Look at the basic building blocks we have. And if we put those together in sophisticated ways, now a computer scientist would know this, someone who's got a, a computer science or an architecture or a computer engineering background would know this, but your everyday guy on the street may not. Um, and uh, so it's worthwhile taking a developmental detour in here. Um, so we've done that. Let's go look at how we'd start to build those things uh, on the quantum side. So we've gone to single rotation gates applied to qubits uh, last week. And, and for everyone here, that's pretty much common knowledge now. Uh, but the multi qubit gates are important. They become serious building blocks when it comes to quantum logic as well. So we've got the C naught gate, the, uh, the C not reverse gate and the CC not gate. And for us, these are basically if programming constructs, um, but only if a condition on the qubit, the conditioned qubit is one. So this, these are ways to begin thinking about those. Um, this is a hugely important component when it comes to quantum logic. So we're gonna spend a good bit of time here uh, and then you'll see this. It's important to develop a nuanced understanding and a conceptual understanding of this. Uh, they will become building blocks moving forward. The other thing I wanted to state just as, as we go forward is, you know, these truth tables undergird the credibility and the trust in an XOR gate. And at all of these other gates, we just, we don't need to follow this dense logic through here. We just know that if someone puts this together and it behaves like this truth table behaves, we can trust it. And that's gonna be um, very important as we get into these quantum gates because things get pretty hairy pretty fast. And once we trust a gate and the way it behaves, we don't have to think about it anymore. So the quantum gate, um, Another thing that needs to be said here for those folks who aren't mathematically minded or who haven't had an architectural background, computer architectural background is binary numbers and how they relate to the gates going forward. Um, so it's important to do a quick drive by here. Um, you know, the, and we'll see this quite a bit in, in this presentation. Uh, we'll see binary numbers. Um, in this case, this would be binary uh, numbers counting up to seven, where you've got the various places, uh, B1, B2, and B3. So this is the ones place, this is the twos place, and this is the fours place. So if you were having a decimal number zero, it's zero, zero, zero. A decimal number seven is one, four, one in the fours place, 
one in the twos place, that would be four plus two is six, and then one in the ones place, six plus one is seven, that gives you seven. Now if you take that and you map that l linearly across here, um, now you've got three numbers here. You've got, um, well, let's look at this one. It's a little bit better. You've got the ones place here, the twos place here, and the fours place here uh, going across. And it's probably intuitive to begin thinking, actually it's very intuitive to begin thinking of this like that. It's one of those nuances that, that the new people coming in would look at and go, why the heck does this work the way it does? And I don't get it. It's also, um, to, to the reason that I'm going through a lot of this dense nuanced stuff is that <clears throat> there's a huge difference. And I want to go back to this. Let me see if I can find this again. There's a huge difference in how you train the PhDs that work in this space and how you train the software engineers that work in this space. PhDs are like black belts. You can train a black belt in martial arts and then when he goes into his full contact competition, you can just assume he knows how to defend himself because he's a black belt. PhDs know how to study. You can send them um, a bunch of stuff like this, hand them a book and go start reading because you're a PhD. You can figure the stuff out. You can't do that with software engineers. It has to be a more methodical approach. It has to be pragmatic. Things have to be explicit. They were never trained in that research space. So there's a lot of fundamental information they just don't have. So we have to be very explicit with that. And that's why I go to, to, uh, to kind of highlight uh, and call this out because it gets missed. Uh, and, and it gets missed um, quite a bit. So um, I think this is important. Uh, we'll use circle plots as well um, in terms of trying to understand things, but but this this matters. So the CNOT gate, um, you know, as we get into regular NOT gate, we, you know, everybody knows what that is. You apply a, a, a NOT gate to it and you get the reverse of it. Uh, the CNOT gates have a condition element here. If there's one in that condition element, then whatever happens down here gets reversed as well. So you see that behavior over here. And the CC not gate is very much like that, except you've got two. And so if both of these are, are, are one in these conditioned elements, then, then the third one down on the, the, the third line uh, gets, gets changed. And you, of course, get ones across the board because these ones going across uh, just don't get affected. They just continue through uh, the pipeline. Um, the reverse CNOT is exactly the same as a CNOT, except it's turned upside down. It's going to be very useful for us, uh, and you'll see this a lot. You'll see both of these in combination very often as we begin to develop some of the logic, the quantum logic that we're going to see moving forward. And of course, there's a CC knot or the Toffoli gate. You get two of them, um, and you'll see those turned upside down as well sometimes. So let's go look at these things. I mean, you know, it's one thing to talk about them, and it's another thing to look at them. So here's the NOT gate, a C NOT gate, and then um, a CC NOT gate uh, implemented in um, in QC Engine. And what we'd like to do is just kind of um, in this. Another thing that you don't know is that this material that I'm put together is meant as a takeaway. And so at some point in time, I'm gonna, I've got it in the GitHub out there. I'm going to uh, open source it and just give it away of the entire series and it's meant to be that way uh, and I'm building it like that. So one of the things we'll do is we'll tinker around, uh, we'll open up another screen over here that gives us a little bit more room for you to see things and we'll just take um, some of these things and do a quick cut and paste uh, over here to, so you see, can see how it works. Uh, you guys have seen this last week where we can look at some code here and I can actually make this bigger so you guys can see it a little bit better. Uh, and I can make the code bigger too. How's that? Whoops, that's really big. Um, and so the beauty about this particular IDE is I can, we can step through it. We can actually step through the process. You can't do this with QIS kit because of its architecture and that's fine. But in terms of t training folks, we need, we need this ability. So we start off with a qubit and, um, and then we attach a knot to it and you see the switch, the behavior that happens at the low level. You know, this is the, the initialization of that qubit. Um, this is, uh, uh, you'll see both the, the magnitude and the phase represented here. The magnitude is, is the, the blue circle, how much of this white circle it, um, uh, it fills. Uh, and if it fills a lot, it's 100%. If it fills a little, it's maybe 10%. And this cross line here is a phase indicator. You'll see that happening quite a bit um, where it just goes 360 degrees top and it goes to the 
to counterclockwise uh, over. And so what we can do is just kind of look at how this happens. Now these two got switched. They switched that, that was the, the not gate and then we can measure it and then there we are, that one right there is the measurement of one. Now, as we begin to tinker with a lot of these things, you'll see the behavior pattern there change. Like there's some weird things happening depending on the kind of structures we use. And it's instructive to see that uh, and then call out why that is uh, to develop an intuition. So let's do, that was a simple knot gate. Let's look this, at the stock knot gate as well. I'm just gonna pull that out, <clears throat> come in here, do a quick um, cut and paste and run that program. And so uh, this is a stock C knot gate. So what we've got, uh, whoops, we can go over here and we can initialize this, this circuit. Um, and then we've, got, we've gone from initialization to the one uh, because we've, we've uh, changed that to a one. Um, and then we apply the CNOT gate and something interesting happens. There's two bits that get swapped. And then we can, of course, this one doesn't get touched. That's the identity gate, but this one most certainly gets changed. So that was a zero going in, now it's a one. But behavioral wise, there's some interesting swapping that goes there. And um, depending on the architecture that we use, the, that behavior um, changes a good bit. So it's, it's again, it's an, an after the intuition being developed here, not necessarily the framework. Uh, let's look at a stock CC not gate here. And hopefully I won't mess this up. This is, I do like doing things live. So there's a CC not gate. Of course, we've got a series of three inputs. So that's the num binary number seven. And so we're gonna put uh, one in the first couple of spots. I'm just gonna go like this. And with this, I can grab this little bit down here. And there we go. That's a little bit better. Um, so here's the initialization. Uh, we've got the first uh, change right there that we've got, the CC not gate takes place. And then now all of a sudden we've got uh, seven across the board. And now all of a sudden you can see that the, um, the last uh, circle plots, number seven is highlighted there. Of course, we've got three spots right here. This, is, uh, this would be four, four and two is six and one is seven. So you can see the, 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 um, uh, the con continuity there. Uh, and then the other thing we could probably do is just run the stock program here. Uh, so this, these examples are also in the, in, in the book and they've got their own uh, stock program here. Um, it's exactly like what I have up there. And um, let's see if I can pull this over a little bit so that we can make this a little bit more legible. And they've got, they do it sort of backwards where they show you how the first one works. And then you see lots of different shifts in here. They reinitialize things. Uh, they show you how the CNOT works. Um, it's a little bit different than I did when I pulled them apart as singletons, but the behavioral patterns are still there. And then of course, the CC knot is there. Uh, and then we get that, um, that, that end result of seven right there. And what I had hoped you'd noticed is the behavior and switching around of some of these qubits there begins to give you some intuition as to how that works. Um, so that's the C knots. Now that's one vehicle. What if we looked at quark and, uh, and, and decided to try our hand with that doing some C knots? And of course we can. And one of the things you need to know is that if you wanna tinker with the, the inputs, you have to tinker with what's going on in this little spot here. And it sort of changes things over there. It's something that's helpful. In this case, it's off and if I tinker it on, click on there, I can put a one in that input and then we can uh, see how the gate behaves. And we'll find that this is very instructive moving forward. Now, a couple of things you might wanna note if you've pulled out Quirk and tinkered with it if, is that it's not just a one and zero that you can articulate in here. You can also go around the entire qubit. So you can put um, plus and minus there. You can put plus infinity and, or plus infinity minus infinity and notice the changes in that. That's instructive. Again, the forefront concern is to develop an intuition, not necessarily to, to develop a competency in any particular framework, but an overall intuition around a concept itself. And by the way, that's done because we don't know who was gonna win the standards war. You know, all those companies out there are vying for dominance. Somebody's gonna win, somebody's gonna lose. We have, we are in a position on the consumer side to preemptively prepare ourselves. And we have to do it in a way that assumes that we don't know who's gonna win. And so that's why we're, we're, we're taking this, this tact. So let's have a look at just a, uh, um, 
just a uh, typical quirk circuit. And uh, right here, we've got, you know, if we start out with um, zero, everything would be off. You would see that these, these things are off. Um, and then if we put a one on here, then we'd notice that both of these are, are on. And in the circuit, we develop an intuition of how this framework begins to um, show that, that we've indeed got something going on here in, in, in the, using this particular circuit. We've got on here and on here that very closely relates to um, what we've seen in this model right here. So we can see the continuity between a couple of different frameworks. Um, now, as you click on this, now all of a sudden you've got plus uh, positive, so that's on the x-axis, and some other interesting things happen. You've got plus infinity here. You've got uh, you've got minus. You've got infinity, minus infinity, and of course we get back to zero. So it cycles through that, and some very interesting things happen over here. Um, we can do the same thing with the CC not gate. You know, we've got uh, we'll just cycle through this and cycle through that, and we've got zero here. We begin to put that on. Not much happens, right? Because both of these have to be. Uh, on for anything actually to happen. We put that one on and all of a sudden, um, the, uh, the third uh, qubit down here gets activated as well. So it gives us a little bit of intuition and, and that's all we're really doing in that. It's, it's kind of child's play for folks who've been in this for a while, but for the new folks coming in, this is new. This is absolutely new. Um, what we could do too is um, use QIS kit. Now we're gonna look at the same problem with another vehicle to develop more intuition about this. Uh, so let's look at QIS kit. We're gonna basically um, uh, run, run this setup program and it's gonna effectively recreate this gate. Uh, let's watch what happens. So we'll run that. And unfortunately I didn't run this before. So as you can see the little hourglass thing up here, it's my system spinning up. It's getting a circuit together and, and all of that. So we've got to wait till that Thing finishes over here. I don't know if you can see that little hourglass right there, but we're all going to have to wait until that's finished. It's a good time to get a drink. And by the way, if you guys who are on the East Coast time want to pop a beer, I will not be offended. This is where you sort of hear that uh, wheel of fortune music in the background uh, while you're waiting for this thing to spin up. And we're done. All right, so <clears throat> it's gonna execute this whole thing. This is how it was built, uh, not um, uh, a C knot and a CC knot. And um, we'll just go ahead and print those out. Um, so it ran it and we get, of course, um, in order uh, one, a one one and a one 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 that very closely articulates to this circuit, this circuit, and this circuit as well. Um, and of course, we can get the state vector and print that out too if we wanted to. Um, interestingly enough, um, because we ran it like this, the last thing it had was just this gate, so we really didn't get information from these two gates except for for digging into it over here. That's what this pulled out, and you can see the gates here too. You know, so we've got some some gates here. Uh, for the simple C knot or not, the C knot and the CC knot. Um, again, the thought is that if you only had this to play with, and this was the first encounter you had with QIS kit, you'd be left bewildered. Like, what do all these things mean? And if we have a number of different vehicles that we can explore these concepts, we can gain intuition, uh, and we need that especially as the concepts get more difficult, the more tools we can come in and look at it from different angles will afford us ways to, uh, to, um, to see that. We could, if you're a little bit good with Python and, uh, and you're starting to know about some of the internals of QIS kit, you can explore the memory a little bit better. Then we get that classical register with 111, uh, basically uh, the, the reverse of that, uh, that result right there that we got right here. Um, and that's, the intro to the um, uh, to the CNOT family. And then we've got the SWAP family. And I wanna go through this fairly quickly and then we're gonna hit a bio break in about three to four minutes here. And let's see what we can do from there. Um, so the SWAP gate is, um, is effectively a SWAP. 
it gets interesting because you can build a swap gate without using the standard swap gates and it behaves differently. So we're going to look at some of those things. You can have a standard swap gate. There's another way of doing it and you can create swaps using CNOTs. Another thing this is, tells us is if you have a gate you need to create, you need to you know what it is, but your stock system doesn't have it, chances are you can build it using CNOTs and swaps. So um, we'll have a look at a couple ways of doing swaps, a stock swap and a CNOT swap uh, over here. Um, and of course, I've got a couple of, of instances of that. We're just going to pull that over here. We're going to put that in here, <clears throat> run it, and then we've got the standard uh, stock C, uh, swap. And so we've got, um, you know, we start off uh, with initialization of zero. Uh, we can um, make that a one. We can sort of uh, write a one to that. Uh, we've got the zero that gets put in at the bottom and we want to swap those. So we are, you know, you know, we can sort of execute the standard swap and then it swaps them. Now, what I want you to see is what happens. It swapped, it, it basically copied, that's a bad word, but it, it moved uh, the value from one to two. And then of course we can measure it and we can see that indeed we got those swaps. Now that behavior pattern I think is really interesting. You know, we've, we come here, we've got this version and then basically the value gets moved over. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as we look to use the C knot <clears throat> to have a look at that swap and how it behaves. Let's go do this and we're going to run that. Now here's a C knot version of the swap. So of course we got the, oops, so let's go back to the beginning. We've got initialization at zero. We're going to write a one to it. The other one, zero gets rent, uh, written to it. And then we have, and I want you to pay attention to the behavior patterns under here because it's instructive. You know, we get the first C swap and then something happens over here. The second one, something happens over here. And the third one, something happens over here. We get the same result, of course, and we have a one here, a zero here, and a one there but the underlying behavior pattern is different. And so we'll see that often. And I think that's important to note um, that you can make, you know, their stock implementations, then they're usually optimized, but we can build stuff if we have to using some standard gates and it may not be as optimized, but it's interesting to see the different types of behaviors, um, particularly knowing that you may have to make something fairly interesting on your own uh, in the future. And this of course is the stock swap test that they have. This was a little confusing, so I didn't quite, for the beginner, so I didn't quite um, wanna look at that. But effectively they're initializing uh, a payload and they're running it through a Hadamard gate to sort of see how it's, it's behaving. Let me just pull this over a little bit. There we go. Um, and look at it this way. They run it through a Hadamard gate. Uh, they do an interesting swap here, run it through another Hadamard gate. Let me make sure I did that right. And then they they, um, they output the one right there uh, in the in that particular qubit. It's a little confusing, so I wanted to break that apart a little bit so that um, there's a number of nuances there that they innately lead with um, that I think that the normal individual would have a hard time following, so I sort of broke things apart there. Um, of course, the conditional swap is the same thing. These, this conditional hap has to, this condition qubit the, the has to be a one before these two get swapped. It's pretty standard stuff these days. Uh, they call it a Franken swap. Um, let's have a look at that. Now there is just one there. And then after this, we can take a quick bio break. So there's a Franken swap. Uh, of course, there's three qubits, uh, one, uh, is here. We're going to initialize it with the one, initialize the next one with one, and then that's the that's the swap. swap. Uh, this is sort of the condition qubit, and these two are the ones that are going to be swapped. Um, and then as you swap that, and then you come back and articulate, you know, what the values are, you can see that those indeed have been swapped uh, in, in that space. And so that's a, just an articulation of how that works. It's a stock swap. Uh, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Um, and in this uh, particular framework, they call that an exchange. So you'll see a lot of interesting things like that. Um, so that's that. 
And let's see. And we'll do, why don't we take a five minute break before we get to this next section. Terrell, do you wanna take the helm and just kind of keep us on track for the next five minutes? I'm on it. All right. I'm so gonna, we'll, uh, I'll put the timer on the screen. Yeah, put the timer on the screen. We'll all take a quick bio break and then come back for the rest of the session. Should be too much longer then we can get some, some, uh, some questions in. All right, everybody, I'm gonna go on mute for five minutes, be right back. All right, Terrell, I'm back at the helm here. So I did see that there was a note, we're waiting for a trail here, but I did see there was a note on, hey, when are we gonna get to GitHub? Um, I wanna wait at least, uh, now I have no problem with this group, giving it to you right away, but I wanna wait until at least I'm done the last one, the last segment on next Friday. Uh, the reason is because I tend to make last minute upgrades and enrichments and I do a lot of work during the weekends because I look at it and I go, mm, I don't really like the way this works and how it's flowing and I wanna upgrade it to give you the best product that I can. Uh, I'm going to wait at least another week and a bit, and then I can make sure if we've got a mailing list from Terrell that uh, 
that we make sure all you guys get that. Ooh. Okay, Matt, you can grab the screen again. All right, have we, uh, oh, screen share, good. Uh, stop the screen share, excellent. And we're gonna go here, do a double click, and then off we go. Voila. So, looks like I got the, I shared the results of the quick poll. Looks like we got a, a workaholic out there. <laughs> Someone with a very large bladder, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we call those bio breaks. All right. All yours. Yep. All right, thank you. So uh, I think we'll we'll get through a good bit of this uh, fairly quickly. So we're gonna we did the swap and C swaps uh, using um, using uh, the QC engine up here. The neat thing is we can kind of step through this. Um, but let's look at how again for intuition's sake, what happens when we implement that in QS Kit. So we'll set up the program. Um, you know, we'll we'll apply not gate to flip a bit. And we'll execute the swap, um, submit the background job. Uh, we've gone through all this before and print out the circuit. And of course you can see um, the, the circuit and then we sort of get the counts and then um, and look at the swaps there. Um, you know, this is fairly straightforward, but it isn't, you know, you don't have that interact. And if you're doing research is great, but if you're, if you are just training someone new, you need to have something that has an interactivity here. So you can actually look at that um, and gauge what happens in internally there. Um, so that's a C-swap uh, QIS kit for the swap gate. Um, very much similar um, for the C-swap gate, we, but we've got three, three registers. We run that, the setup, um, we're just going to swap a couple of these things, um, execute the swap. Pretty standard stuff if you've if you've done this before, and then we print out the gate. And then this is what it's going to look like. This is sort of what our model is. This is how the we have um, constructed that, uh, and then we can print out the actual runs, and you can see that we've got the one zero one. Now, here's a thing that a nuance that I want to bring to light that uh, anybody who's played with, with VMware or Chef or Puppet who is creating infrastructure by code. You know, you write a line of code, you develop a, a, a network circuit and a hard drive and, and RAM, and you can create an entire computer that you can actually install our operating system on uh, and install that operating system by code. Well, what we're doing here is very much the same thing. You know, and the beginners won't really understand that, that, you know, we're, um, we're actually creating quantum infrastructure with code and then submitting that to, as a job, the results come back and we interrogate those as well. Um, that's an important nuance to get across to beginners that that's really what we're doing here. We're not actually creating code that works like Java does or Python does. All Python, what we're doing is just manipulating that that circuit, maybe adding a few things to it here and there and some flow. Um, but in the back end, we have to realize that's all that's happening. And I think that's that's kind of important. So we've done all the all the gates. We've gotten through here. Let me just kind of give us a, a come back up here. We've gotten through this part. We've examined this, uh, the standard digital logic. We've looked at some multi-qubit gates. We've done all of these in some detail. I mean, they're fairly easy to go through. Now we get to something interesting. We're going to map digital logic to quantum logic, and then we're not gonna build something. It's just a simple basic adder, or incrementer and decrementer. Now this is some of the fundamental things that, that we do, but um, but that methodic approach will, will be very helpful moving forward. And that's what this deep dive number two is mapping Boolean logic, digital logic uh, to quantum logic. And I've realized that there are some folks when they first start getting in here, never had a digital logic class, never had, uh, you know, hadn't ever seen what these gates are, the digital logic gates. 
And as I started digging into this, I'm like, this, this is something that needs to be articulated. The mapping of the two is really important. So classical knot gates have their quantum doppelgangers and classical XOR gates have their quantum doppelgangers. And so what we really wanna do is, is look at some of those and then experiment with them. So we have, the, uh, we have these, you know, you've got a knot gate, you've got an AND gate, you've got a NAND gate, you've got an XOR, an OR gate and a NOR gate. Some basic gates, but we can do some really interesting things with those. And this is the digital equivalent of that. And this is the quantum version of that. So you're gonna see a, a digital version of the AND gate. And here's the quantum version of that AND gate. You'll see a digital version of the NAND gate. There's a quantum uh, logic version of that. And of course you can see that the, that the knot and the, and the C knots and the CC knots loom large as constructive, building blocks into those sophisticated circuits. Um, the XOR gate, we've got an XOR there. Um, the OR gate is a little bit more complicated, interestingly enough. And of course, your NOR gate's got some fair complications to it as well. Now we're gonna look at this through a number of different areas. And here's a reminder, I'll pull these up quite a bit. Um, and then um, we've got a number of code here that I just want to highlight and come over here since it's a little bit bigger, show it to you. And we'll run this and these are all of those gates. I'm gonna shrink this just a little bit. I don't know if I can move these around too much, but um, these are the various, whoops, did I just mess that up? And not, nor I don't think I got all of that. I don't think I did. Let's try that again. Okay, that's much better. So now we've got the whole gambit of those. And, um, and I think for edification's sake, I'm very curious to have you look at what happens in this space. Now we've only got three, three qubits. We've got really two, two qubits of concern and an output qubit. So there's not a whole lot going on here uh, in terms of scale, but, but there is a lot in terms of interest. So a standard knot gate, you've seen it before. Um, you have, uh, we initialize something as zero up here and we apply a NOT gate to it um, and we get an output and its other outputs are zero. But what's interesting, whoops, what's interesting is when you have multiple qubits, you apply a NOT gate to it. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of switching that goes around on, on around here. Uh, that, that those are side effects. And as we start getting into a little bit further into the quantum algorithms and the phase kickbacks and things like that. Those side effects actually matter quite a bit. Some very interesting things happen there. That's sort of a, a spoiler for the future. Um, so that's the NOT gate, the AND gate's very much the same thing. We get initialize two things as, as one there um, and apply the AND gate and it swaps around. And of course you can see that we come out with the digital number seven uh, and there's a lot of switching around that goes on there. Uh, the NAND gate is another thing of interest as well. We initialize things, we apply a NAND gate that's not AND. And by the time we rotate a few of these things around, um, you know, you get these massive rotations. And at the end of the day, uh, we do get our output, but the behavior patterns under here are things that I wanna have highlighted out here. Um, it, it helps as we get into further into some algorithmic development to get the concept that there's really some interesting things going on here. Um, XOR is gonna be the same thing. We, you know, we, hot, we initialize things. Uh, we've got an XOR here. Uh, we can tinker with it. And then um, the, uh, the output is what we would expect. Um, and, and that's the output there. Uh, in this case would be digital binary number three. Uh, OR is gonna be the same thing but it's gonna be a little bit more complicated. So there's a number of gates here that do a lot of switching around um, because there's not a stock OR involved in this framework, but we can build one. And of course, at the end of the day, um, we, have, we have the result from there and that would be digital number five. This would be four plus zero uh, in the two spot and then one in the one spot gives us digital five, binary five. Um, and the NOR is going to be not a not OR. Uh, and so the logic there switches things around. And of course, as we cycle through it, we can come out and see what that result is with the one on the end uh, in the four spot. And so we get four there. Um, it's interesting to see how some of these building blocks behave. So that's important that I wanted to kind of show you there. Uh, and of course, 
this is probably of, of, of fair value from an intuition's point of view, um, where you've got the binary system here, the point, the decimal points, or the, uh, the placements matter. Um, for instance, if you're dealing with just uh, a standard XOR here uh, that deals with, um, oh, I don't have it here. Actually, I don't, but there's one here that uh, would only trigger if there was one in a two's place. So it would fire if there was a two, three, six, and seven that came through this qubit space. Um, that's the level of intuition that needs to be taught because uh, it's not obvious. Um, we've done this on the other screen, so I won't burden you with that. <clears throat> Let's do that same thing with Quirk. Now, I won't go through all of these, but what we're gonna do is use another framework that um, we can use to explore ideas. And, and for people learning this stuff, the ability to vet it in another framework to get consistent results gives you confidence that the thing you're doing is actually correct. And we need that. Um, one framework just won't cut it. So uh, this is an OR gate. Um, and it's the standard OR gate. So if we have, um, these are on and off, they're all off now. So this is the control bits and this is the, the output bit. Um, and if we turn this one on, we're gonna uh, have, this will end up uh, as an OR gate coming on. Um, we can put this one on too. Uh, and that's, that will also as an OR gate turn on. Uh, interestingly enough, that's not the only things we can do. We can switch around the entire qubit here and watch how this thing behaves. Um, in other aspects, having a 75% here is actually kind of an interesting uh, a result. And so the ability to build useful things with um, the various inputs, whether it's negative infinity or positive infinity, um, I'm not gonna go into right now, but has value to us. So this is the, uh, looking at an OR gate in, in Quirk, we could, literally build all of these if we wanted to. I'm not going to burden you with that, but I did want you to see at least the, the OR gate represented in here. Um, and then, then we're done with that. Um, now let's build something. Let's build something interesting and look at it from a number of different directions. And let's just build an incrementer and decker, a decrementer, an adder and a subtractor is really what we're gonna do. And, and, and what we'll do is we'll throw a little bit of interest in here. We'll, we'll uh, uh, add some randomness to it. Um, and we'll build, basically build these circuits. So we'll prepare a, uh, a payload here. Uh, we'll use four qubits across. So it'll be eight, four, two, and one. Um, in this four space, we'll use a, a Hadamard gate uh, and a 45 degree rotation. Now, what that's gonna give us is a randomized version of either, we're gonna submit a one to our incrementer, either, or we're gonna submit a five. Uh, and that's what this does. It's really what all it does is it says, hey, and we could have, we could have forced it, but, but this is more quantum, um, uh, quantum-esque. But you'll see a, a couple of different parameters here, either a, a, a one or a five that will either go into increment or decrement, which will end up being either a two or a, a six, if it's incrementing by adding one, uh, or it will be, um, a, a four or a zero on the decrement side, uh, four or one on the decrement side, uh, depending. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, basically, I'm gonna take all of this again and we're gonna come over here. We'll do this and you'll see that we have um, preparation, increment and decrement. And we can watch how these behave over here. We've got uh, 16, uh, 16 circles here. Uh, we will start off by um, writing a one to the qubit right here. And then all of a sudden for the fourth qubit, we can we can uh, put it in superposition with Hadamard gate and then execute a 45 degree um, phase gate on there, which would be your X gate. Uh, Z gate, sorry. Um, and then you'll see that if there's a phase change there. Now, of course, we, we, in this case, we came out with a one. If we decide to run that again, we could come out with a five. So there's this bit of randomness that's inherent in this preparation stage. We don't know what it's gonna be, but at least here we can poke around with it. And get the QIS kit, we're gonna have to make 
multiple runs just to see that behavioral pattern. But we've got a five here and there's our five. We've got a 45 degree uh, phase change on that. Now that's going to loom large in the way this thing behaves. But, um, but effectively, I'll spare you all the details. We'll just go and we're going to increment this thing. And now all of a sudden that is a six. So we've added one to it with quantum logic that's effectively based in its digital logic counterpart. And we've created an increment function um, that we can run on a simulator that does that job. Um, and it, you may not be able to see how super awesome this can be in, 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 in engrossed in a larger um, system just yet, but you have to start small. And we're, now we've got that, we've got that six that we've got sitting out here. Um, we can measure that too. That's this four and two is six because we're looking at the four spot and the two spot. Um, that gives us six over here. And, um, and then we can decrement it again. And now we've got five. And of course, we're back to the original five. So what this is showing is that we can take these C not gates, not gates, and, and in correct order, we can make a standard incrementer or a standard decrementer, um, not unlike its digital doppelgangers that we used um, up here, it's half adder, full adder, full adder, and subtractor, that kind of stuff. There is a correlation between those uh, and that perspective of how things can get developed incrementally with these gates is a useful comparison to make. Um, and it's good to see the the um, uh, the quantum uh, doppelganger of that uh, in in action. So, of course, this is a little bit more um, background. You know, you've got this is what a one will look like. This is what a five will look like, and then off we go. So we've done this. Um, let's try that work. Why not? Just because. Um, so this is the same gate. We've got an adder that we're looking at, an incrementer. Um, and we'll look at the decrementer uh, below. And these are for refreshing your memory, but, but effectively this is that same circuit, you know, where we've got, um, we apply Hadamard gate. And in this case, it's gonna be pi over four. In the previous uh, presentation, we talked about how radians and pi and, and uh, af affect the, 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 um, the phase elements of a qubit. Um, and then how the degrees can fit into that as, as sort of a, a cross-reference. Um, but if we wanted a 45 degree uh, phase change operation, we would just do pi over, over four and that would do the job. And let's just start from scratch. Well, we've got a one here and, and I had to do something interesting to get this one on. So these are what we would consider on. Like if we came up here and said, you know what, I want five. Right, I want to prepare a payload of five and, and, and under this, and so that we would have this capability here, uh, this result here, this is how we do it in Quirk. So we've got that result there. We've got the one and the four, that's going to be five. Um, but I had to, instead of doing a one or a zero uh, here, uh, I had to do uh, negative, uh, and that seemed to get the job done. And then we can see how I could use, create the exact same adder gate, the exact same increment gate, and then as we come back on this side, we see that um, that the uh, we get the result we expected. So we got, this is effectively in the four and two space, so four and two um, is what we're seeing. So this is zero, one, two, three, well, one, two, three, four, uh, and that will end up being six. So we've constructed a, an incrementer. We can see it represented the continuity and consistency in two different frameworks. And for us, that gives an intuition into the concepts that would be absent by using just one framework. That's the value of doing this. Um, same thing with the decrement. Uh, we can say, I'd like to do a five uh, and then run a decrementer. There's the five as well. Um, and of course we can tinker with this as well, but that gives us five, it goes through the decrementer. And of course we get four, this is the fourth spot. We can see how the decrementer would work in an entirely different framework. Um, and then we can use QIS kit to run through this as well. Uh, we've got, uh, now this bit is a helper function. So I'm going to run this, but you can ignore this for, 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 uh, um, for all effective purposes. Um, but then we set up everything. We've got four registers, um, that, that effectively mimic, uh, this over here. It is somewhat different though, because QIS kit has a stock add function. And so we're going to see how that works. Um, so we've run that. 
uh, we're going to do a main where we can tinker with things. We can add an increment function or a decrement function. I'm not going to do the decrement function right now, but we can run it again and do that. What is interesting is that it has its own add int function, uh, which is your stock incrementer. We didn't have to build it. We could have built it, but we didn't have to build it. Um, and it's interesting to see the gate, the circuit gate that gets produced here. So we're just going to run this. Um, and this is just for um, edification. And we'll run the main part of that. Uh, we'll measure everything real quickly. And then we'll execute the back end. Um, we'll use a memory equals two for true flag. So it gives us a bit more uh, intuition as to what's going on there. Again, this is the 8-bit table for reminding for those folks who aren't uh, indigenous into the binary space or it's are a little bit rusty. <clears throat> and then we'll try to get the output and print it out and, and do some interesting things. So we got the output. Um, it gave us a two. Uh, because there's that random part of it again. Um, and so I was able to print out the places here. This is the one, the two, the four, and the eighth place. Uh, there's some weirdness as to how the state vectors return things. So you've got to sometimes do things backwards and do weird joins just to get things in, in, in interesting spaces. But the classical register came out as a two, and that's what we would expect. Now, <clears throat> I'll run it again to see if we can't get a five. But, um, but the gate that it used, as its an internal incremental, did not resemble the gates that we had up here. They were different, um, primarily because we use a series of not gates. And we had shown you in, in, in the swap gates too that, that the behavior patterns of those things that are inbuilt for the particular framework you're using is different than if you build them on your own. And so we do see that here. Let's see if I can run this again and see if it won't give me a five. Uh, to, as, a, as, a, as a way to, um, to show you a little bit of difference in this. We're just going to run that main again and run this. Cross your fingers. Let's see what it gives us. And nope, just gave us a two again. I'd have to run it a few times uh, for that, but I think you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> and I asked some questions and then sort of you can interrogate the output state again for intuition. And in the two position, you see that there is a one. So that's a little bit, um, a little bit of a deep dive, uh, but, but it does help looking at that thing. And that, with 15 minutes to go, is what I call the end. And so Terrell, I think we could open up the microphone to ask a bunch of questions uh, in this space and see where it goes. Um, you mean you want to ask us questions? <laughs> no, I think I'm going to be the one on the receiving end of this beating. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gloves are off. I think anybody can un unmute. Okay. Hi, uh, Matthew, David Garvin here. Um, thanks for that. Very interesting and building the intuitive feel for things. Can I ask one question about the quirk uh, um, decrementer, incrementer circuit that you showed, if you don't mind going back to that. The, it looks like it's got those double lines, which I thought they increment, I mean, that they imply a, a, a measured output. In other words, it's a non-quantum, but a classical bit. Is that, am I interpreting that correctly? Because then uh, you, it's the classical, you but then you're just applying classical logic to it. Yeah, I, I think so in this. And I was, uh, this is one of the things that, that you get yourself into when you're starting to make subtle changes like two hours before you're getting ready to present is that um, I tried to make it resemble, oh, where was it? Um, up here a little bit. And I had forgotten that um, I put these measurement tags in over here just to um, to get a feel for what's coming out. It. And yeah. then when I went back in the circuit, I'm like, oh, of course they belong there. I'll just throw them in there. But you're right, they don't belong there. Yeah, that's what okay. we call a that snafu makes... around here. Uh, no worries. It's lots of very cool stuff you've done here. You get sure fix that and we sure. get to try doing it the other way or stuff. Yes. Bonus point for paying extra hard attention. Yeah, that was an excellent call out. I'll make sure I fix that. Thank you. And if I may um, take some more time, just for everyone's interest. So I, I played around in Quirk 
between your first presentation and this one, trying to look at that um, rotations that it was doing away from having a phase of zero on the um, on the zero ket that when you applied a, a y rotation or something um, and it looked like it's bec it's actually just doing what you would expect in other words it's not trying to keep a um, a zero or an only real number in the, the zero ket so if you do a rotation by i then it changes the phase on the zero um, so that's how I explained to myself how you got like those lines going at 45 degrees when you applied some rotation vectors rather than the zero staying on the zero ket staying on zero and the one ket having the whole phase associated with it. Yeah, I, 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 this is kind of a hack actually uh, that I, I stumbled across and it, and it may not be a correct hack, but what I really wanted to do is find an eloquent way to, to turn this, this on without just, I, I suppose I could have just turned this on and, and eliminated all of this and it would still work just fine. Like you could literally go like this and go like this and go like this and go like this. Go rid of that, go rid of that, and then just turn this on. Yeah. And then you'd get the same thing. And, you know, that's what happens when you sort of rush right before you're getting ready to present. You're like, I think I can illustrate this. Um, and then yeah. you. Or, or you could have it as a zero and do a X gate. Yeah. And there's X number of ways you could do that. You're right. Um, and, and it's best to do it the most simple way. I think, you know, the, the, uh, there are, um, side effects to a lot of these things uh, that that you really want to have control over, especially with magnitude and phase, because uh, it gets really weird at, at certain times. Um, so good call out, excellent. Thank you. I'll keep quiet now. Not a problem, <clears throat> Cynthia. You have yourself on unmute. Uh, you've got a question or anything? Hey, Matt. Can you hear me? Um, yes, this is hi, um, I'm Aaron Turtle. Thank you very much for your presentation. This is Pathik Reet. Um, I'm primarily from a different background, like I'm a database administrator for by profession, but for various, um, I mean, for my past background with physics and everything, I came to, I mean, quantum computing about a year and a half ago, and it it, it really is exciting. Uh, I have a question for you. So, <clears throat> do you have any way to reverse engineer it? a complex truth table for an example what i'm trying to say is suppose um we get i mean we have a set of inputs and outputs in our hand uh, after observing some sort of an experiment now if we want to um, translate that into a quantum circuit uh, it's very difficult i mean uh, when we have a gate in front of our hand uh, we can easily translate that uh, logic to a quantum circuit but can we do a reverse, like uh, if somebody present, and, and do we have a software for that? Like I provide any sort of um, truth table and we try to build a gate out, I mean, quantum circuit out of it. So I, I think I know where you're going with this is that, um, and the, you know, the short answer is no, but I think the contextual answer is significant. Um, there are like, if we're not the producing in the producing group and we're in the consuming group. We're gonna take this technology, we're gonna go around the larger enterprise and find those problems that are quantum friendly or quantum force friendly and use quantum to get a speed up or an advantage or something like that. We have to be able to identify patterns that we know work. That in your, if I'm not mistaken, you're probably in the hunt of how do I look at a problem in the wild and then convert that to some it, kind of pattern that I know quantum. Exactly. Exa yep. Exactly. So let me show you something. Um, I'm going to pull you up something here. Bear with me here. Um, I mean, even if some some sort of like uh, the the page that you're showing, is there any way to incorporate that kind of thing in your page? Well, I think what I I'm going to do is show you the magnitude of the question you just asked. <clears throat> so this is the course structure of what we're building to educate folks in Optum. And um, what we've conjectured, and this is why I knew the magnitude of the question you just asked, is that let's take the ultimate goal and at reverse engineer it. 
from a business process. So until quantum gets to be ubiquitous and we can actually use it in the physical sense, the only thing that we have to justify from a business perspective, not an intellectual and academic perspective, but from a business perspective, um, unless we're in the producer space where we're playing with sensors and stuff like that, is patents and the defense of publishing. You know, that's uh, something that a, a business person would look at and go, okay, you can justify me spending money on you doing this, this, this effort. Um, and that's legitimate. And, and, and you know, that's what we're going to do. But if you backpedal of all the things that need to be for you to do that, you find a couple clear demarcation points. Starting from zero, you got to get a bunch of engineers up through the basics uh, where they have to be introduced. And that fer ferrets out those who, 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 um, who can make it and who don't. Then you sort of have to get them groomed up in the theoretical and practical aspects of, of quantum. Like they've got to develop software engineering chops. That takes work. So let's assume you do that. So this quantum workshop is half of that in, in the course that we're creating. And then we've got a number of other things we're filling in for this. That gets you here to this. You've got the theoretical background to be able to step in and maybe figure out this next step. How do you, and we call it the applied step. How do you take a quantum engineer who's got who's got software engineering chops and professional consulting chops, which means you have a business tenant to you. You understand the business domain you're operating in. How do you, with all of this knowledge, go into the business domain and ferret out those problems that are either quantum friendly or quantum force friendly and, and then collate them to work on them? So that's the first discrimination uh, capability that, that we don't have. And then second is, let's say you get a portfolio of those problems that are of magnitude of your, of your organization, then how do you look at each one of those and break it down into its component parts that a quantum speed up might be applied to give you an advantage? And this is the secret sauce. The question you just asked was, uh, applies here. And this is where the billions are going to be made because those patterns are out there and we'll see some patterns, some basic patterns if in some of these other um, uh, presentations that I'm gonna give, but the macro patterns, the more complex patterns are out there. And if you can develop a portfolio of patterns that say, if I can see a problem in the wild that's closely resembled this, I can force it into a state in which I know that I can use quantum and I can show it in the simulation side that will give us a speed up. That is the secret sauce right now. And no one has that. But in the consuming side, in this side of the fence right here, that's the thing that people are going to need to do. That's the race right there. And if we can do that, um, that's where the, not the millions, that's where the billions are going to be made. So okay. that's when you first ask that question. I'm like, I know exactly what you're asking. And I have no answer for that yet. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, hey, other Matt. questions. Matt, this is Alex. Um, have, you, have you done any research or have you looked at um, kind of the kind of computing that was happening in the adder days or in the days of assembly level programming that was actually beneficial to the industry? Because I mean, you, I think we're coming up in the same direction, right? And there were certain industries uh, that did leverage that very simple logic. Um, and I mean, obviously, you know, I work, I've worked in insurance companies as well. There might be some actuarial math that might be relevant, but, um, you know, it, it's, we're not at the fundamental level in an insurance company that some other industries are at usually. And there might be some applicability if one looks back and thinks about, okay, what kind of problems did Adder solve? And then maybe work their way up from there rather than starting from what we know as far as the internet and web pages and, mm -hmm. you know, my, uh, machine learning. And we're making our way backwards from there. Yeah. So there's two things I think that, um, and this is like, this is the hunt right now. This is as we start preparing ourselves, that's the hunt we're after. Two things I think could help out is that, 
Uh, we know digital logic matters. And you'll see that when we come to problems and practicals, uh, the presentation there, you'll see that when it comes to simple quantum algorithms, that digital logic actually matters. There's a bunch of really cool stuff in quantum logic that doesn't exist as a, as a digital doppelganger when you start getting into entanglement and some of the other interesting things are phase kickbacks really funky. I, I suggest everybody drop acid before we start talking about phase kickback. It'll make it go down a lot easier. But um, so that's one thing. I think that that logic space <clears throat> is going to give us some intuition. And as we get further down the line, um, that will help out. Uh, the supercomputer industry, I think, can give us some uh, assistance there too, because they also have to deal with unique hardware um, and then the software operating systems that go with it. Uh, there's a fellow who's in Quantum Palooza, um, and I forget his name, but he's wonderful. Um, I think he's in Quantum Computer Inc. Uh, and he came from the supercomputer world. They have that same problem where you have to develop new architectures, and then the operating systems have to coalesce with that, uh, and then the engineers have to wrap, get wrapped around that. There's a number of patterns that those guys have seen over and over again that I think we could do well to be apprised of and then see if any of that will help help move the needle forward for us. Yeah, that was Steve Reinhardt last night, actually. Yes, Steve Reinhardt. Uh, had had coffee with him. He's a Minnesotan uh, with, uh, with our cohort. Great guy. Very smart. Yep. Okay, thanks, Matt. Other questions? Anybody else? We've got John Chen out there. Hey, Matt. We've got uh, keepers. John's or different John. Okay. Um, sort of a philosophical question, just building on the Q and A that that you just had. Um, I can appreciate looking at the the digital logic to help understand some of what what's going on with quantum gates. Um, but I'm wondering, do we unwittingly constrain our thinking by turning to what we're familiar with, uh, digital logic, uh, as as we try to explore the the quantum, the realm of quantum gates? Oh, I, I think you're right. I, I think that's a it's a crutch initially or a stepping stone for the newbies. Um, but I think that the folks who are really doing stuff out there, they're they're mental patterns work a lot different than ours right there, right now. I mean, folks who are in the PhD space uh, who have lots of different training than we do, especially those who are really adept at the complex math, um, what they can see, we can't. They see patterns that, that we can't. And ultimately, I think we're going to have to, if you're not a math person, you're going to have to pick up some math to, uh, to help you in that space. But I would agree, you know, that, that we're not in a digital world. We're in a quantum world. Um, and those quantum patterns out there to be aware of it, become aware of those and, and be able to see those in the wild. Uh, again, that's where the secret sauce is um, on, the, on the consuming side. Hey Matt, I have a pretty naive question. For all these logical gates, I can achieve the same thing using traditional programming, traditional computing. What is the advantage of using qubits here? So you're going to see that next week. And there's a lot of things you haven't seen where this is a methodical series that we're sort of incrementally going into. What we haven't really shown you um, in depth is, is how superposition entanglement and, and combined to give us things like phase kickback and, and a lot of other unique um, uh, capabilities that just don't exist in the digital world. There's absolutely, because we're dealing with subatomic particles, some funkiness that happens in there that just doesn't happen in the macro world. And the uh, idea of exploiting that, particularly magnitudes, uh, magnitude logic and phase logic, um, in addition to the inherent parallelism that you get with qubits, when this, you know, you add a qubit and, and the state space doubles. Um, there's a lot of factors there that are, that we need to continually call out uh, for the newbies in there that we say, this is different than your class, than, than the classical digital world. This is also different and this is also different. There's a number of things uh, that are, that are, um, that are real clear um, 
mile markers in this space and we'll call them out as we get there. I'll, I'll continue to point them out and go, hey, this is, you don't have a doppelganger like this in the digital world. The root of not gate is one of those things as well. I mean, it's a small example, but there's no, there's no uh, doppelganger in the digital world. And Keeper, I think we have you here. You're our, I think you're our resident, other resident PhD. Uh, any thoughts and reactions on, on what you've seen today? Oh, yes, actually, I was just gonna comment about um, finding patterns, you know, and being able to get higher variability from qubits um, using angular momentum space in addition to magnetic spin. I think that we have to move away from the zero and one thinking and understand that, you know, there's high degree of variability when it comes to actually uh, using states of matter. And when we're looking at a very complex dynamic of human interactions um, or, you know, whatever we're trying to correlate in many, many different dimensions, we're going to have to break away from that very basic level of zero and one. We can extend that, you know, if, if we're just looking at a basic line, we have to think about not just that line, but how we rotate that in the complex plane. And so we just have to move away from the linear thinking to the complex thinking. And, you know, so at that point, we find those uh, higher interactions in, in the patterns. So that's what I had to add. Thank you. And that is, see, that's why we love to have PhDs on staff, because uh, they have um, and I don't know how many PhDs we got sitting on, on staff now, and there's certainly some, some very bright people, but um, the level of training that a PhD has relative to a software engineer is very different. Um, and, uh, and they can literally see things that we can't, and that's why it's very important to have those folks. Uh, so Keeper, thank you very much. Any other questions from the crew here? We got Cynthia out there. Cynthia, have you any questions? And we've got a few other folks out there. Spencer's on the line. Yeah, thank you. I thought it was great. I, I appreciate the questions too about the the uh, how you apply it and how the quantum differs from regular standard bits. So I'm listening to each and every one of them. I think it's a, it's a great presentation so far. Okay. All right. Oh. Oh, okay. I have a I have a question. I'm I'm kind of asking this late. Um, what would you? I I don't know if this is off the wall, but would what would you say for someone who's a little bit rusty on things on uh, physics? You know, your your physics is about like ten or twenty years old. Um, I would say don't feel bad because there's plenty of people here who don't have any physics. I think. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't. You're you're in good you're in good stead. That's why, um, you know, when we got back to where's that that slide again. Um, this one, you know, the idea that the folks who are building the tech, who are building the, who, who have the physics background to enhance this, this, the, the, the material science that are using, that are holding subatomic particles, uh, long enough to do information processing, um, they're in this space. They're in the make it space. They're with the producers, the guys who are making the various sensors and, and all the other computing components that go on the producing side. And this is kind of how I categorize those. You know, the rest of us kind of are on this consuming end. We're going to take whatever they give us, whoever wins this war, whoever, you know, number of folks uh, win that war in, in whatever category it is, uh, and that try to apply that to something in, in the real business world. And it's always been this kind of relationship. Producers of some tech and the consumers, we're sort of playing a catch up game, but our educational needs um, on the consumer side really fall into broad based categories, software engineering and professional consultancy, the ability to talk to C-suite and business people and investors and line level folks, um, you know, that kind of stuff, very different skill set, really fundamentally different skill set than the opaque math and dense quantum physics that you'll find in the producing it. Now these consultants are a hybrid. You will see them be both, you know? Um, so we want really talk about them, but, but for us, the, you know, the whole premise behind this workshop is that we can get this job done without dense quantum physics and opaque math. Um, we don't necessarily need them to be functional in, in the space, um, in the consumer space. That's the, that's the hope, that's the idea, that's the premise. So don't feel bad about not having, having that. 
you know, if I can add my two cents, I mean, I think, I think this whole uh, notion that we need to really get into the physics is uh, kind of overblown and it depends on what, where you're trying to position yourself. So, you know, in the 1940s, you certainly had to know how vacuum tubes worked to get a computer to do anything. You needed to know how electricity worked, you know, uh, even physical switches, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I've been in classical computing for 46 years and I'm still figuring, I'm, now I'm just figuring out Ohm's law and some, uh, you know, things about electricity only because I started digging into the internet of things. So I really think that, you know, the amount of physics you need to know other than four or five terms and what they mean uh, is something that's really overrated. We need to know it now, I think, to have conversations with people in the field because, uh, you know, I, I think as Matt said, they're, they're dealing with the, with the, uh, the tubes and, and things like that. But I don't think that's a, a necessary condition for being successful in this field. At least I'd like to think, uh, you know, as these machines become mature and they start appearing up on AWS and in Azure and all that, we're, we're not gonna care what, you know, uh, whether it's a proton or electron or all that other good stuff, really, I think. Right, but I think that in certain, depending on your domain, uh, you'll have to have some capacity in it. Like if you're in quantum chemistry, that's a whole different domain. But just as a history lesson, you know, this is where uh, I think Terrell was talking about. If you remember those, if any of you who remember vacuum tube days, you're dating yourself, but I remember those. Um, and that's, that's a history lesson of, of, um, of binary computation. They actually tried electrical, mechanical, and hydraulic before this, unsuccessfully, but the vacuum tubes all the way up to solid state transistors into, um, into integrated circuits is, is a real history lesson of how binary computing uh, came about. And its doppelganger is on the, you know, on the, um, on the quantum side, you've got all these other man various manifestations that are vying for, for dominance in this space. Um, the clear winner is not, not apparent yet as to who's gonna, who's gonna win this. There's some strong contenders, but, but anything can happen. So that's just a little bit of history there. Um, and I, I agree with Terrell, but also depending on the domain you're in, um, you're, you know, you're going to have to have variant levels of, of math and physics uh, acumen. Like if you're in quantum chemistry, it's a whole different domain. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it's all about domain, you know. Yes. And, and, and you know, we're going to get to the point, not today, but where, you know, anybody can program Python now if you just sit down over a weekend and and you know you got the stomach to debug programs, and it's really all about the domain and being a domain expert, and you know being able to turn the dials and switches, et cetera. You know when I was a 20 year old, I I would go work at a French bakery in Philadelphia and write programs for them, and I had to understand their business, and then I put it into the computer, did it with a hat manufacturer, et cetera. So I I pretty much have that same paradigm. The technology is just a simple you know a, a tool. We, learn, we need to learn the quantum computing way of thinking, but it, it's really, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about that domain expertise, which, which I think is underrated right now. But, you know, we're still in 1940s. They didn't care about, you know, whether you were an accountant or, a, you know, a, 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 you know a, a, what's that, artillery person, you know. Agreed. Hey, Matthew, I do have one question if we still have just a moment. Sure. Uh, when you're doing the different uh, diagrams and you're stepping through, and it looks like some of the bits are flipping between them. I, I'm assuming that it, they're not actually flipping the bits from one to the other. Yeah, so what is happening there actually when you see in the diagram that they're shifting? This is where you take a big breath and go, you know, I'm not entirely sure to tell you the truth of why these are shifting the way they are. Um, but I do know that it's, that it's related to um, the, in, well, I know of a couple things. So the, what you can't see here <clears throat> and what we tried to show uh, in the first lecture is that there's this thing called interference that's happening between the various waves. Um, 
and you'll see that as some of these gates begin to interact with each other. There's also a superposition that, that gives us some unique um, capabilities here. Um, but what exactly those things are and the spins, um, there is quite a bit of dialogue <clears throat> in, um, let me see if I can find this. I may have to go back to another area. Let's see if I can find this for you. <clears throat> Oh, let's see. It's quite a bit of dialogue about that in here. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but exactly when and why and how all those things are spinning, um, I would be remiss to tell you that I'm an authority in that space. Okay. And, and that's one of the reasons why I said you just have to, like, you have to trust that the folks who have made that, that infrastructure did the job right. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, it's for a visual representation of what's happening. It's not that the qubits are are tr uh, transporting themselves from one to the other at this stage. No, I, I think once you uh, and and maybe we can defer to, to keeper on this, but once you have um, you know the the physical architecture of of qubits, whatever substrate they're using, whatever mechanism they're using. Um, I think this is more for visual understanding of what's happening. Um, yeah, I think I, it's just the states that begin to move between those qubits. Those qubits don't actually swap. Right. Okay. Thank you. Is it the measurement of the qubits at that particular point of time? Like when you shift through the, <clears throat> sorry, when you shift your, yeah. So is, is it like the measurement is changing from that qubit to this qubit or? Well, I mean, when you when you initialize qubits, that's a pretty standard process. You apply Hadamard gate, um, then you put them in superposition. That's a pretty standard process. Um, but when you measure it, <clears throat> now you're getting a, you know, we've we've actually destroyed the wave function right there. You're actually getting a um, uh, a, a a true measurement out of that. Now, this is an interesting thing. It, it, this is a, a simulator, and the simulators represent the ideal state that I think much of the hardware has to sort of catch up to because the math behind the simulators uh, are pretty solid. And so because of that, we can, um, we have the luxury of inspecting intermediate representations in the simulator where we would, when we went to say QS kit and started doing the same thing, we didn't have those same luxuries because that's not how it actually worked under the hood. I think one of the things that I, bring this simulator as well as other ones to bear for is because it's an educational vehicle allows us to get an intuition about the various concepts. And that's more important to me than the frameworks right now. There's various frameworks, depending on what you have, um, they're going to represent qubits in very different ways and process them in very different ways. But the concepts that we're trying to grapple with, if we get a solid understanding of those, that will help you navigate any framework that you're in. And that's the, that's the, the philosophy behind it. Hey Matt, if I, am still, uh, if I may, it's still one of your minutes. <clears throat> um, and your um, portfolio of customers, do you guys feel the need to include the communication industries like uh, um, in the companies that are uh, dealing with, with, with the communications. In other words, um, do, you, do you see any, are these companies gonna have to change, adjust to the quantum world? So I, help, say that again, help me understand what you're, what you're asking. I wanna make sure I, I get the yeah, nuances like, right. Yeah. Cool. Sure. Like for example, I, I noticed that uh, customers included like uh, um, insurance companies, uh, companies from uh, pharmaceutical field, and so on. But what about the companies from the networking world? Like let's say Cisco, Juniper. Okay, these guys do they have to go with the wave? With the oh, I think you'll wave? probably see that group along with the. You know, like there's first movers in this space that are going to have to really be the the guys through the trenches first. Uh, you know, the security folks, the networking folks, all of those infrastructure guys are going to have to get out there uh, and lead the pack, I think, in that space. Um, because 
the infrastructure allows everything else to happen. Uh, I would absolutely think that the security folks are going to be one of the first ones in the front lines out there. Um, generally, the bureaucrats, like I work for a healthcare insurance company, and we, you know, Optum is part of that 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 group. Um, you know, we're a little bit we're going to be a good bit slower to that to that party. Um, <clears throat> the executives just don't have the foresight to see that. The the patent guys do though, and so that's really one of our legs in. Um, you know, do, you know, you get patent portfolios in this space uh, ahead of the ahead of the field, and, and allows you to navigate and operate freely in the open market. So they're very interested in what we're doing. But you know, does Dave Wickman actually care what we're doing down here? Probably not. Okay. I think we're on overtime. If we take him any further tonight, he's going to send me a big bill. <laughs> so uh, it's a Friday night anyway, at least here in. Uh, in Harrisburg. So uh, thanks, uh, everybody. You got like 24 of you still on there. Todd, Spencer, Sarita, Robert, Keep Bob, or John. Yep. I could say that. I say John, and it covers three or four of you. Alex, and every. And 424251. I forget your name, but. Uh, I don't know why it shows me like 4251. My name is Patrick Reed. I'll try to see if something oh. can be. Yeah. Actually, actually, I think I can allow. Hello. Oops, I think I can change your name or whatever. Anyway, uh, everybody have a good weekend. Matt, once again, thank you. And don't forget, folks, Monday evening, same channel, same time. Good night. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Matt. Appreciate thank your time. You. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Great talk. Thank you, guys. Hey. <laughs>